Pro-woman, pro-choice, pro-life. In society's perception, I'm a walking contradiction, an impossible creation, an inconceivable piece of fiction. I'm neither probable nor possible, therefore I'm tauntable and mockable, because society laughs at what is different and ignores the incomprehensible. This really isn't about me, you see. No, this is about hypocrisy, a societal mentality that says only some people can truly be free. In our supposedly tolerant society, pro-lifers are goaded into silence. We are mocked into compliance and destroyed if we are defiant. We are neither understood nor accepted and we're not welcome except if we're willing to compromise and just live with the widespread murder of our fellow children. We are considered misogynistic and anti-choice and while we are entitled to our voice, there are many who seek to silence us as if we were just background noise. But there is one question that I must ask through the fear and hatred and strife. Is it at all humanly possible to be pro-woman, pro-choice and pro-life? Third wave feminists will scream no. As a woman and gender studies student, I would know. And even the most accommodating abortion advocate will deliver the exact same blow. When responding to my question, they say, please don't be elusive. Supporting abortion and supporting choice are never mutually exclusive. They go hand in hand, feminists will tell me. And so unfortunately, you cannot exist. And yet, against all odds, I do exist. I am pro-life and pro-choice, as well as a traditional feminist. All these beliefs I hold while still staying true to my worldview. So please try to stay open-minded as I explain myself to you. Pro-life equals pro-choice. This is my hypothesis. And I say this because hearing the pro-abortion rhetoric is getting monotonous. The stereotypes say that pro-lifers are anti-choice, that we hate bodily autonomy and seek to silence a woman's voice. Personally, I find these stereotypes quite uncouth. As I will go on to prove, nothing could be further from the truth. Every day, in every way, I make choices about my life. I choose to have long hair, I choose what I want to wear, and I choose what path to pursue as my future career. I choose what I want to believe, I choose to stay in university or to leave. I choose when I want to sleep, what I want to eat, where I want to go, and who I want to be. As a pro-life activist, I am thankful for my right to choose. Contrary to popular belief, choice is not something I want to lose. Even now, I choose to use my voice to speak with intelligence and poise to combat the societal noise that says pro-lifers hate choice. And yet, while I am thankful for my rights and freedoms, I am also a mature adult who can recognize limitations. I know that rights come with responsibilities and choices come with restrictions. The reality is that choice can be dangerous when it is misused. Pedophiles use choice to bruise, rapists use it to abuse, and every other criminal who is accused has in some way refused to recognize the limitations of his or her right to choose. So please, don't be confused. Pro-lifers do support the bodily autonomy of women. It is the idea of choice without restriction that we oppose and condemn. The unborn child is human, according to basic science, despite his or her total reliance on a woman who may not be compliant. At the moment of conception, a new life has been formed. While that life is one single cell, over time it is transformed. One cell splits into two, and then into four, and then into eight, and by day 21, that child has a separate heart rate. At the moment of fertilization, that child has a separate DNA. And so while pregnancy can be confusing and throw life into disarray, please allow me to convey that to brush away that life would betray what is right and therefore justify murder for the sake of a woman's plight. Our society says that we humans are not allowed to steal, kill, and destroy. And so using science and basic reasoning, though our stance may annoy, pro-lifers can therefore condemn abortion, which kills a baby girl or a baby boy. Setting aside the discussion of science that makes abortion advocates doubt, I want to challenge the idea that choice is what abortion is all about. According to recent research conducted among women who've had abortions, 64% of American participants said that they felt explicit coercion. They couldn't make a real decision because they only had one option. Out of the numerous post-abortive women with whom I've spoken, 80% said their abortion decision was not chosen. Rather, it was a procedure forced upon them by friends, families, and doctors, a so-called solution seeped in coercion that left their individual free will broken. 
in the end, the numbers matter very little, whether they're on one end or the other or somewhere in the middle. The fact that there are post-abortive women who felt that they had no voice exposes the reality that women today are not given a true choice. So please, don't pretend. Abortion has nothing to do with women's empowerment. Choice is not the motivation of the abortion on demand movement. While I know many abortion advocates care about women, it is women's oppression, not liberation, that is advanced through abortion and coercion. Setting aside the pro-choice label, my next hypothesis is that it is possible to be pro-woman and pro-life while remaining morally stable. First and foremost, there is the obvious observation. The majority of pro-lifers are beautiful, emancipated women. We are from all walks of life, from every group imaginable. So the idea that pro-lifers hate women is truly unfathomable. And yet, despite their gender, pro-lifers are inherently pro-woman. I can prove this by examining their opposition to sex selection. Sex selection abortion is the epitome of misogyny. It is a practice that says only boys are welcome into society. While many refuse to recognize that it's a common practice in the West, sex selection is in every country and it refuses to be repressed. The notion that abortion empowers women is something that I must question. How can abortion advance women's rights when it promotes blatant discrimination? As a traditional feminist, I am secure in my pro-life perspective because if abortion is meant to help women, it's extremely ineffective. I can openly declare that I oppose discrimination based on gender, so I will not surrender to the idea that pro-lifers are the offender. If we are honest with ourselves, sex selection is being used to undermine equality, and so as an advocate of women, opposing abortion is my responsibility. The cure-all abortion theory, this is the final thing I wish to address. It is a disturbing phenomenon, one that brings me much distress. When it comes to the real issues that pregnant women face, our society's response is a complete and utter disgrace. If a 16-year-old is homeless, in an abusive relationship, and unexpectedly pregnant, abortion is the go-to solution while real options are conveniently absent. Even if abortion was moral and not harmful to that teenager's well-being, nothing about her situation will change because abortion is not freeing. After the abortion, she will still be homeless, still be without support and trapped in abuse. So no matter how much we comfort ourselves by saying at least she could choose, the abortion industry had everything to gain and this woman had everything to lose. Trapped in an unexpected pregnancy situation, this young woman felt instability and frustration, impossibilities and possible humiliation. And so from a state of agitation, when offered only one option, she made a so-called decision and went along with the abortion. After the deed has been done, we in society pat ourselves on the back, ignoring the root issues of abuse and lack that still paint this teenager's future in black. I believe that if a woman's plight is brought before me, it is my responsibility for the sake of equality as a feminist, pro-life activist, and compassionate civil human to offer her something other than abortion, something called a real solution. So while the abortion debate has forced our society to pay a toll, pro-life and pro-abortion advocates have a very similar goal. We seek to protect, support, and empower the pregnant women in society. The only difference is that I know my rights don't require someone to die for me. While empowerment is our goal and support is our mission, there's nothing empowering about telling women to let someone kill their children. We live in a civilized nation, a land of equality and aspiration, and yet we are a pitiful creation because we refuse to recognize that it is the crisis that must end in a crisis pregnancy situation. So please, listen to my plea, for the sake of women, if not for me. It is time that we cut through the rhetoric, division, and strife because it is absolutely possible to be pro-woman, pro-choice, and pro-life.